Hello, everyone, and welcome to Literary Tales. I'm your host, Paul Krauss, and in this episode, we're exploring the great poem by John Milton, Paradise Lost, the greatest poem of the English language, and arguably one of the greatest poems in the history of all human civilization. John Milton's Paradise Lost is an intense poem, a passionate poem, and an erotic poem. From the visual imagery to the descriptive language Milton uses to portray his lively and arguably passionate scenes, there is no escaping the reality of the force of life that moves his poem. Why, however, did Milton choose to write such a poem, and to whom was he writing? And responding. When reading Paradise Lost, discovering the passionate theology, the theology of the passions, is what the reader must come to wrestle with and understand. Is John Milton a man for our time or all time? The blind and pugnacious, indeed radical English poet, arguably wrote the greatest epic in the English language. It is also my favorite poem. While claiming to justify the ways of God to men, Milton's remarkable poem is not only a window into the battles of early English civilization, it is a gateway into the mind of a prescient man who served as a precursor to the English Augustan age, an age that confronted the sterile mechanicalism and materialism of the emergent Enlightenment philosophy, an era duly remembered as the Age of Passion. Eros in Greek does not singularly mean sexual passion as it does through our now deracinated English language inheritance. While Eros does mean love, in ancient Greek from Homer down through Thucydides and Plato, Eros could better be understood as the intensity of the passions, which produced ecstasy, both sexual and non-sexual. At various points in the Iliad, a work that Milton was intimately familiar with through his collegiate education, Homer employs Eros in non-sexual and sexual settings, and Thucydides incorporates Eros in purely non-sexual, ecstatic political contexts, especially in the funeral oration and Alcibiades', Alcibiades speech advocating the Sicilian expedition. In knowing the actual Greek context and use of Eros, because Milton was schooled in the classical humanist tradition, he incorporates a sense of the erotic in his poem. And thus, we might better understand Eros when looking at the erotic cosmos and the world created by Milton as the passionate life force that moves creatures of love into madness or ecstasy, from which the intensity of the passions manifest themselves, both in sexual and non-sexual ways. It is all about the ecstasy of feeling and life, and love. One might ask, why not consider Milton's cosmos and poem as simply passionate instead of erotic? To be sure, passion and passionate are more neutral terms that are not loaded with the contemporary potential negativity of eros and the erotic. However, passion and passionate fail to fully capture the august Lebenskraft, which Eros and the erotic do, the life force that moves Milton's poem. Moreover, at the end of Paradise Lost, the love which the archangel Michael explains to Adam is more in line with the classical tradition concerning the connectivity, the connection between Eros and Theoria, which I will return to at the, end of this, at the end of this lecture. While I will use the terms eros and passionate, erotic and passionate, 
somewhat interchangeably, know that the eros which I speak of, the eros which guides and constructs and moves Milton's great epic, is an ecstatic intensity of passion which the word eros more fully embodies and implies than does the simple word passion. Milton's grand epic is an erotic poem. From the visual imagery to the very descriptive language Milton uses to portray his scenes to us, we cannot escape this reality of the life force, the ecstasy, the passion, the eros, which moves the entire poem. Thus, we need to ask, who was Milton writing the poem to, and to whom was he responding? It is important to remember that by the time Milton was composing Paradise Lost, the Caroline era had come to a violent end in the English Civil Wars and the Restoration under Charles II, which was underway. Milton was a devoted nonconformist, an enemy of the popish Catholic aspects of the Anglican Church, but also a heterodox nonconformist, rejecting the deterministic supralapsarianism of Cambridge Calvinism, exemplified by men like William Perkins and William Ames. So even though Milton was a Puritan's Puritan, he rejected the Puritan theology of Calvinism, but he also includes and promotes in the grandest form the Puritan theology of the passions. We must remember Unlike the Victorian mythmakers and our contemporary ignoramuses who speak of Puritan theology, the Puritans actually offered us the most passionate theology since created in the Christian theological tradition and imagination. The idea of marrying somebody who was a loving partner but also a spirit companion was actually the theology of the Puritans. The Puritans elevated sex in marriage as the greatest gift of God in their theology. Thus, the heavy emphasis on family and family life in Puritan theology. It was actually the expression and extension of their exalted view of sex and passion in marriage. This, of course, is all reflective in the poem. But then there is also the intellectual currents of philosophy that Milton was dealing with. Francis Bacon had just published his Novum Organum and New Atlantis, which charted out the modern scientific materialist outlook that would give birth to mechanical philosophy and eventually utilitarianism 150 years after Milton's death. Thomas Hobbes had also recently published his Leviathan, which, among other things, continued the materialization of philosophy and denied transcendent morality altogether, strongly promoting a mechanical philosophy of causality, determinism. The emergent materialism and determinism of English philosophy, both in theology and science, was stripping the world of love, of passion, of eros, and turning it into a bland world of causality and motion without any zest. This intellectual reality must never be lost to the reader of Paradise Lost alongside Milton's own political and theological radicalism. The focus on the individual and the individual's genius to understand the reality of the world through private revelation and the poet's reinvention of genres was, for the great sociologist Max Weber, the great creative enterprise of Protestantism. Freed from the constraints of the priesthood, intermediaries, the church, and defined forms and traditions to which one needed to belong, the shattering of old norms and established hierarchies gave the Protestant poet, even if perhaps a still practicing Catholic like Alexander Pope, a new power to embark on his own adventure. In all respects, John Milton is the very embodiment of the quintessential Protestant poet of individual genius and reinvention, 
which reverberates down to the present day, even with postmodern criticism. Milton's poem is a truly erotic poem. Passion bleeds through its pages from start to finish. The visuality of the poem, its ability to conjure up images in our mind, is truly intense. The poem begins with a sort of preface, restating the standard Christian theodicy of the fall of man, and speaks of the promised coming of Christ. Of man's first disobedience, and the fruit of that forbidden tree, whose mortal taste brought death into the world, and all our woe, with loss of Eden, till one great man restore us and regain the blissful seat. The poem then shifts into its true epic narration, beginning with the defeated rebellious angels having been expelled from heaven for their rebellion, the construction of pandemonium, and the parliamentary-like debates over the next course of action. The debate in pandemonium begins to reveal Milton's cosmos as being governed by Eros, intense passion, through the speakers involved. Bilial, one of the speaking demons whose advocacy mirrors that of the defeated latitudinarians in English theology from the Civil War, gives an uninspired speech, an uninspired speech, calling for submission and peace before God who has expelled them. Bilial's name in Hebrew, by the way, means worthless. He gives a truly worthless speech because it is not an erotic speech. It is not a passionate speech. It is lame and therefore worthless. The counterweight to Bilial's speech is the intemperate Moloch, who gives an impassioned plea, more than a speech, about trying once more to, stir, to storm heaven with even greater vigor and resolve than before. Beelzebub also speaks, advocating an easier enterprise by seducing the heart of the new race of man created on earth. Beelzebub's speech is passionate, but to the careful reader, and here is the great catch, it is also seductive. Satan decides that Beelzebub's course of action should be followed, but he is the only fallen angel capable of making the ascent out of hell onto earth to see with his own eyes this new race created by God. Satan's heroic journey to Eden draws on many classical parallels. It is a journey of trial, visions, and encounters much like Odysseus or Aeneas. Milton, as we've already mentioned, was well read in the classics, and he had a knowledge of not only the canonical classics, like Homer and Virgil, but also recently rediscovered poems of antiquity, like Silius Italicus's Punica. All of this influenced his rather scandalous reimagination of the heroic journey, descent, ascent trope, with Satan's laborious struggle through the chaotic, watery void of the earth and entry into Eden. Satan swims through primordial chaos and overcomes the dangers to eventually spot Adam and Eve, perched in each other's arms in paradise, but not without first meeting sin and death, who ominously foreshadow the malevolent intentions of Satan. Satan is no hero. His journey is an inversion and cruel parody of the classical sojourn. The encounter with Adam and Eve sparks a sort of jealous love triangle, befitting of any poem dealing with the erotic passions. The real reason why Satan is so filled with resolve to destroy God's new creation is because he beholds all the good things that the new world holds, of which he is deprived. We witness then a passionate Satan rather than some banal villain with plans of vainglory and egoism. The Satan who looks over Eden, Adam and Eve, and the beautiful world just created is a jealous, 
envious figure, a figure filled with emotion and passion, just like the rest of creation, but passions that are manifested through deprivation rather than fulfillment. And this is one of the remarkable achievements of Milton, for Milton informs us that evil and sin are the byproducts of the deprivations of our passions rather than mere attempts to fulfill them. Evil and sin are the result of the emotions of deprivation, jealousy, envy, anger, and hatred. Satan's spotting of Adam and Eve strike us as peculiar, perhaps thanks to our own paradoxical puritanical sentiment, even though the Puritans of the 17th century, as mentioned, had a very elevated theology of the passions, which is exactly what Milton gives us, even if we read it as somewhat peculiar. But the image is very moving because it is scandalously erotic. Satan looking out over the Garden of Eden and seeing Adam and Eve, here is Milton's great line. From this Assyrian garden, where the fiends saw undelighted all delight, all kind of living creatures, new to sight and strange, to a far nobler shape, erect and tall, godlike erect, with native honor clad, in naked majesty, seem lords of all. The second image of our earthly parents is an equally sensual and erotic one. So spoke our general mother with eyes of conjugal attraction unreproved and meek surrender, half embracing leaned on our first father, half her swelling breast, naked met his under the flowing gold of her loose tresses hid. He in delight, both of her beauty and submissive charms, smiled with superior love as Jupiter on Juno smiles when he impregns the clouds that shed May flowers, and pressed her matron lip with kisses pure, aside the devil turned for envy, yet with je jealous leer malign eyed them askance, and to himself thus plained. What we witness in these remarkable lines by John Milton with Satan is an Eden, a garden, a world, an entire cosmos that is teeming with radiance, beauty, erotic sensualism, and life, but most importantly, love. The cosmos which Milton has just described, from the storms of primordial chaos to the wondrous and sex-filled Garden of Eden, is the antithetical, the antithetical reality to the mechanical philosophers and scientists who see only material objects moving and bouncing off each other in predetermined laws of physics and the laws of motion. Milton is arguing against that empty, dry, mechanical cosmos. Instead, he gives us a cosmos filled with passion, filled with movement, filled with life and love. The cosmos that Satan journeys through and sees, the cosmos which fills him with intense jealousy and envy, is an erotic cosmos moved by love, passion, and intimacy, the very things that Satan is deprived of. The world in its ecstasy and radiance is Milton's poeticized fruitio dei, the fruit of God life and love, passion and eros. Milton's material world is not dry or sterile, but governed by the passions which bring life to the dirt, trees, and leaves, and most of all to our human father and mother. He in delight, both of her beauty and submissive charms, smiled with superior love, as Jupiter on Juno smiles when he impregs the clouds that shed May flowers. 
Milton is confronting here the sterile materialistic cosmos emerging from the proto-scientific intelligentsia, which is stripping the universe of its mystery and beauty and passion just as much as he is offering theological criticism, a criticism of the determinism of the Calvinists, and a re-embrace and promotion of the Puritan theology of the passions. The world we witness is a steamy world of life, spirit, and zest. It is a world of grandeur and beauty, pleasure and erotica, intensity and intimacy. Not only is the newly created world filled with great passion, Satan himself is filled with newfound passions, the negative passions of deprivation, envy, jealousy, and being deprived of the good things that this world holds. As such, Satan's new resolve is what propels him onward to destroy this truly beautiful and loving world. Yet in this juxtaposition, we see a passionate villain tied to the passionate world he seeks to upend. Satan is not an intellectual villain. He is a passionate villain. Satan is not a cold, mechanical, lifeless supervillain, but a villain of flesh and blood emotion. Satan is a, is a villain filled with the emotions of jealousy and envy which stem from the deprivation of his passions. And again, we see Milton's grand theology and philosophy of the passions within Paradise Lost. The goodness of the passions lead to love and fulfillment. Adam and Eve in each other's arms, having sex through their matrimonial love. Likewise, we also see how sin and evil are the passions of deprivation, the jealousy and envy which now govern Satan. The fall of man, as Milton poetically describes, is the product of relational deprivation. When Adam and Eve were first created, Eve is nearly enslaved by her own voluptuous beauty, which she sees when she sees herself in a puddle, reminding us, of course, of the great classical image of Narcissus. As I bent down to look just opposite, a shape within the watery gleam appeared, Bending to look on me, I started back. It started back, but pleased I soon return. Pleased it returned as soon with answering looks of sympathy and love. There I had fixed mine eyes till now, and pinned with vain desire, had not a voice thus warned me. Adam save Eve's from herself. This brief moment is important for the reader to remember, going forward, because it establishes the precedence of loneliness and the impossibility of passionate embrace, which would be tragic. Alone, we are in sin, evil, and alienation. Satan, for instance, doesn't have any companions with him. In the intimacy of embrace, however, we find love and the fulfillment of the passions. Alone, we lack intimacy and can only embrace unreal distortions of ourselves, like Eve looking upon her puddled reflection, which can never truly fulfill the passions that God has given us to find fulfillment in the love of another. Satan, again, if we recall, is in Eden, completely alone. Satan's loneliness deprives him of the intimacy and passionate ecstasy of life and the sensuality that he sees, whether it's with the animals or, of course, with Adam and Eve, which drives him to jealousy and envy. He ventured alone into the world and is therefore deprived of the intimacy that comes with another. Alone, he tries to wreak havoc by prying Adam and Eve apart from each other. That is how Satan is going to cause the fall of man. He is going to remove them from the intimacy of their love together and attack them when they're alienated and alone. The passions which Satan exudes in his loneliness are really the governing passions of deprivation. Here, Milton is very Augustinian in his theology. Satan is not without passion, as we've so clearly been describing throughout the poem, 
but the passions which govern Satan are negative ones because they are the result of privation. And if, we, if you remember Augustine in the Confessions, evil and sin are the result of privation. Satan cannot love because he has no partner to love. Satan cannot make love as he sees Adam and Eve doing because he has no partner to make love with. Satan cannot rescue others as Adam did to Eve, as we just saw, because he has no one to rescue. Alone, the passions which govern Satan are necessarily reductive and destructive. Hence, he is gripped by envy, jealousy, and hatred, the ultimate passions born from lacking, from deprivation, from privation. Adam and Eve initially share a relational mutuality. Thus, they are completed in the presence of each other and destroy this relational mutuality, thereby depriving Adam and Eve of the good passions they enjoy in each other's arms and presence is now the task of Satan. And here it is important that we mention the bad readings of the Romantics of the 19th century. The sympathy towards Satan among the Romantics in the 19th century and onward is due to these readers and critics having been deprived of many things in their own lives, thus causing them to passionately yearn for love, restoration, intimacy, and naturally have sympathy for Satan because they lacked the very same things Satan lacked. In their own lack, their own lacking, and their own deprivation, they haphazardly sympathize with one character, the one character who in the poem is most like them, the devil. And thus, we even see it today. People continue this tradition of terrible reading of Milton's Paradise Lost. Those who are alone, those who are alienated, find sympathy with Satan because they are like him. They are alienated, alone. They are filled with envy, jealousy, and hatred. But the, the entire goal, the entire purpose of this poem that Milton is creating for us is to show how in the love of another, in the love of another's arm, in the love of another's bosom, the passions, the deep erotic passions that govern our soul are truly fulfilled. Love requires another. God, however, has seen the serpent and dispatched Raphael to warn Adam of the danger that faces them. This leads to a lengthy discourse on the war in heaven and the intensity, so intensity continues here, of that conflict with great battles, duels, and heroes in the arms, reminiscent of the great classical war poetry of antiquity. And here it is important that Milton wanted to one-up the great poets of antiquity. For the war of Troy and the war to found Rome was between humans. But the war in Paradise Lost, the war in heaven, is a battle of immortals. Much, much greater much, much more grand than the mere combat of those men who can die on the sands of the earth. Nevertheless, the fall of man occurs when Eve separates herself from Adam. And so again we see the problem of alienation and separation leading to sin, evil, and death. The refreshment, whether food or talk between, food of the mind or the sweet intercourse of looks and smiles, for smiles from reason flow to brute denied, and are of love the food, love not the lowest end of human life, is what is lost in the fall, the passions of fulfillment. Read the lines again and listen to the lines again. This is what is lost through the fall of Adam and Eve. Refreshment, whether food or talk between, food of the mind or this sweet intercourse, of looks and smiles, for smiles from reason flow to brute denied, 
and are of love the food. Love, not the lowest end of human life. Love is what is lost in the fall because we have been separated from our lover. Here, Milton explicitly states that love, just as the Puritan theology of the passions declare, is not the lowest end of human life. Celibacy is not the highest goal of theological virtue, as it is in Catholicism and the monastic tradition, but love, the intensity of love with a partner, is the highest reality, for love is not the lowest end of human life. Eve's request to divide their labor apart from each other, to separate and go alone, just as Satan had attempted to achieve in planting the first false dream in Eve earlier in the poem, is the catalyst of our demise. Our fall is predicated on separation, on loneliness. For in separation and loneliness, we lose the reality of relational love. What Milton suggests through the separation of Adam and Eve, whom we have seen together throughout the poem, is that love, pleasure, enjoyment, all of those good things we have in relationship, are destroyed and ultimately lost without the intimacy of mutuality. In other words, as we've been saying, loneliness is the cause of evil because loneliness is the ultimate form of deprivation from the interconnected world we had beheld throughout the entirety so far in Paradise Lost. The Paradise Lost is nothing less than the intimately connected world of relational love from which the fulfillment of our passions, the smiles, truly flow and are fulfilled. It is in the love of another that we are happiest. This is revealed to us in Eve's eating of the fruit, how in losing Adam, she is greedily engorged without restraint. She eats without control and with no relationship to the world. Life is now just about herself. The images of passion which tickled our fancies and made us fawn so lovingly over the splendid world of Eden in the earlier books of the poem are now images causing revulsion and disgust. Greedily she engorged without restraint. Lastly, she falls into idolatry by praising the tree rather than God as Adam and Eve had been doing earlier. Note here that when Adam and Eve were together, they praised God. But now that Eve is alone, she falls into idolatry because idolatry is always about the self. Thanking the self and being happy only through the self for what one has, rather than recognizing the interrelationship of the entirety of our world, our being, and our love. As Eve realizes her death in disobedience, jealousy, an emotion we had only previously seen in Satan, enslaves her. As she says to herself, I shall be no more, and Adam, wedded to another Eve, shall live with her enjoying, I extinct, a death to think, confirmed, then I resolve, Adam shall share with me in bliss or woe. This loss of mutuality and relationship of love is what caused the fall in Milton's poetic reimagination. And again, notice the jealousy, the envy in Eve that we had only seen in Satan when she thinks of what's going to happen in the future. Adam wedded to another Eve. I shall be no more. This other Eve who Adam will marry shall live together in enjoyment while I am extinct. And then she says that she is resolved that Adam must share with her in bliss or woe. With this as our understanding, the understanding of the theology and the philosophy of the erotic passions that we have so intimately been deconstructing and understanding, 
we can now fully realize the gravity and the romance of Adam's decision to die with Eve. As our mother and father reunite and have sex, they are overcome with guilt, shame, and humiliation. The negative passions, the emotions wrought from deprivation are now enslaving them both. This too, however, is a grand achievement by Milton, given the reality of his erotic cosmos, a cosmos governed by passion. The cosmos, even after the fall, is still governed by passion and remains an erotic cosmos. But the cosmos after the fall is a cosmos where passion no longer leads to enjoyment, no more frutio dei, but to hatred, jealousy, envy, guilt, and shame, the passions of deprivation now rule over the world. Why then, given the chance for reconciliation with God, does Adam instead choose to die with Eve? On the one hand, Milton's hand is forced by the biblical narrative, as we know, to include the fall of both sexes. Adam and Eve must die together. On another hand, we realize that Adam's decision to die with Eve, rather than live alone, is what must transpire in a cosmos of mutuality. Alone, Adam would be miserable. With Eve, however, he still has a partner, a wife, and a lover. To choose loneliness would be to choose damnation. To choose companionship, even in the fall, paradoxically, brings salvation, and it is, according to Milton, a choice. And this is a choice that leads to the coming of Christ, the ultimate manifestation of choosing love. Adam's choice to die with Eve rather than live alone in paradise is the ultimate act of love. And this is also something that a handful of church fathers saw in seeing Adam's decision to die for his beloved as a sort of prefiguration of Christ and the church. The archangel Michael then appears and informs Adam of the future of the human race as he presents the grandest Theoria vision in the poem. In yet another great achievement by England's greatest poet, we receive a spectacular retelling of the biblical story from Cain and Abel through to the incarnation, death, and resurrection of Christ. When Michael informs Adam of the terrible stories of sin, Adam grows despondent and is governed by new emotions of fear and sadness. When Michael informs Adam of the goodness of God, the triumph of love, the coming of Christ, we see the inverse of those passions of deprivation. Adam rejoices and is governed by loving happiness. With these new revelations complete in faith and love, Adam rejoices together with Eve and leave Eden on their solitary way. The end of the poem contains the greatest erotic image, Eros again in that classical understanding linked to ecstatic visuality. The revelation parted unto Adam of the future of the world and the human race fills him with joy. He is overwhelmed by the great love of God before departing the garden and is so governed by happiness instead of despair, sorrow, or sadness. The end of Paradise Lost also foreshadows salvation and love in its fullness. Adam and Eve are reunited hand in hand and embark on their pilgrimage beside each other. The intimate and passionate world which Milton created and has defended against its many critics is also the bridge to our own journey in life. Solitary, he writes, their journey may be, but they are not actually truly alone upon closer inspection. They are together, and providence with their guide is also beside them. They, looking back, all the eastern side beheld of paradise 
so late their happy seat, waved over by that flaming bran, the gate with dreadful faces thronged in fiery arms. Some natural tears they dropped, but wiped them soon. The world was all before them, where to choose their happy place of rest and providence with their guide, they hand in hand, with wandering steps and slow, through Eden, took their solitary way. Love, intimacy, and togetherness remain the final image of Milton's splendid poem. We just need to know where to look, and when we do see that reality, we shall understand how love binds all things together and keeps us from separating disillusion, the separating disillusion which causes us to be governed by the deprived passions, bringing misery, jealousy, and envy in its wake. That is why Adam chose to fall with Eve and to be with her, because in choosing to be with her, Adam chose love, Adam chose salvation. The beauty and paradox of Milton's ending is that while Adam and Eve are said to begin their pilgrimage in solitude, they are in reality, as we see, together, just as they were before the fall. And now they have providence as their guide, which they previously did not have in the garden. They have come even closer in relationship to God. God was always at a distance, working through angels, but now, in the final sentence of Paradise Lost, we are told that Providence is with them as their guide. The journey of Adam and Eve, the journey of human love, now begins, having been expelled from the garden. But it is a journey, guided by the very intimacy of love, which we had glimpsed all along throughout the poem. Hand in hand, with wandering steps and slow, they begin their pilgrimage with providence as their guide.